When we speak about jewellery, many people think about the materials used to create jewellery, precious metals or gemstones and so on. But jewellery pieces often tell stories. They can contain memories and are the expression of the maker. They're often also made with well-considered techniques and potentially bear traces of the tools used to execute them in the materials they end up being made of. For some makers, they are a vessel for communication and jewellery making is considered a socio-political art form. To discuss these subjects, the stories jewellery tell, or what narrative jewellery is, as well as discuss his practice, the techniques he uses to craft his work and his role in education, I have invited Jonathan Boyd. Without further ado, thank you very much for coming along, Jonathan. Thanks very much, Sophie. Thank you for having me. So my first question, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, so I'm an artist of sorts, a, a jeweller of sorts, a writer of sorts. But I, I am. I'm, I'm an artist who works through um, objects and through jewellery. And I'm also an academic and a researcher. So um, all of my research is, is practice led. Um, so I'm interested in, in quite broad range of, of, of theory but it is through practice where and making where I, I suppose the real knowledge is come out for me and I, I'm also the head of applied art so that's the head of jewelry and metal and ceramics and glass at the Royal College in London so I'm working constantly with people who have a creative practice um, as an educator, which is really, you know, it's really exciting. I also work with a, a few people who taught me, actually. I studied at the Royal College of Art, so I'm very lucky I work with people like um, Professor Michael Rowe, who was, who was my hero uh, and my mentor, and now he's, he's my friend and colleague, so it's, that, that's what I do, generally. Going back perhaps to the beginning, what drew you to the artistic field and in specific perhaps the field of jewellery? And what did your journey into the field look like when you were starting out? So you did mention you studied at the Royal College of Art, but where else did you go to learn the skills you have today? I mean, I suppose I could, I could go right back. I was always going to do something creative, either that or end up in jail, I suppose. <laughs> you know, for, for me making is 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 being it's becoming you know it, it's an expression of of living you know if i'm not doodling and writing you know i've got quite a distracted mind so if, if i'm not drawing or writing or making you know i sort of fall into vast feelings of despondency and and depression you know making and creating is, is sort of my only way of, of, of being and so you know, a, a career in arts, I think, was pretty obvious. You know, I've, I've got like a young, I've got a six-year-old girl now, and she's so like me in the way she spends all of her day drawing and writing stories and little pictures and annotating them. And I was the same, you know, I, I, when I was a kid, I just used to make like hero figures out of toilet rolls and stuff at my, my grandparents. And when I was at school, I was okay at art. I was good at art, but, you know, I'm not a painter or, or, or you know, and I think that when I was at school, the, the emphasis was, I think, sort of on, on, you know, those sorts of traditional fine arts. And one day I found a kiln, actually. We, we found a kiln in, a, in an old room that hadn't been used in 30 years. And so I started doing enameling experiments, just, you know, old enamels on bits of copper. And I don't know, I think there was a mixture of, of, of the making and the materiality of, of, of metal and glass and enamel powder and the heat and the intensity, you know, that you feel a bit like an alchemist, don't you? And there was a scale thing. I was like, oh, there's a scale here that I, I really understand. Whenever I was painting, you know, it was always like little tiny little paint brushes. You know, I had an interest in painting those little figures and stuff when I was a kid. And so the scale, you know, small detail, fascination, things that fascinate you. And so I, I was lucky enough to, to get into Glasgow School of Arts, um, and I taught there as, as well as an academic a few years ago. But they've got a really sort of craft-focused education there, and that was really good for me. I mean, I, I, in terms of education, I had like a proper sort of end of 90s, early 2000s education where I, I think I was not sober for the first two years and then finally realised I wanted to be an artist and make it a career and, and sort of got more serious as I went through. But that, 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 you know, giving of skill and giving of technique 
has been really important because it's allowed me to to push back against that you know and i think a lot of the work i do now is a questioning of, of received and perceived knowledge you know knowing that i can do it means i probably don't want to but i know that i can because i can it's something to push against so i studied at glasgow and i also studied at the royal college a few years later under under hans stofer and michael rowe it was just the most transformative time of my life you know it, i realized that you know i wanted to do postgraduate study because i think if you do an art school for four years, you get taught a method of working, which is fine and it works. You know, this is how you have a design process. You, you know, you do research, primary and secondary, then you do this, then you do that, then you do this, and then you have a thing. And it sort of wasn't enough. I wanted to know how I worked, you know, how do I think, how do I make, how do I work as, as an artist? And so I think that's what studying at the RCA gave me was like a really open understanding of, of how I work, how I think, I don't know if that makes sense. It, it also cemented things that I was very interested in, the axis between philosophy and, and literary theory, which is where I, I have a lot of interest in. I like words. I'm sort of dyslexic and a little, you know, I've also got a sort of hyperactive thing. And so I'm not of the world's greatest reader. Maybe I understand words. I certainly know I understand words in different ways from my partner, who's, who's who, who part of the job is writing, you know. And that's why I always say I'm a sort of writer. But, you know, that, those sort of main ideas I wanted to follow throughout my career were sort of really cemented whilst I was there, you know. You describe your work as narrative jewellery and consider jewellery as a socio-political art form. So what is narrative jewellery? What's your definition for it? What sort of the methodology behind its creation as a socio-political art form? That's a really good question. Whilst I was at Glasgow, I studied under a guy called Jack Cunningham, actually, who, who wrote a PhD on narrative jewellery at the time I was studying there. And he had, he had at that time this really fantastic show he put on as part of his PhD called Make Aware of Viewer where I saw Hans Stofer's work for the first time. I saw Marana's work for the first time. Otto Kunzli, you know, they, they were all there and they, they came to, to Glasgow and they all had a party. It was, it was incredible. And Jack, Jack wrote this thing about narrative jewellery. And in a way, I sort of think my understanding of narrative is actually quite different from that education I had. So it, I, it, there, there was a sort of a field of, of narrative jewellery or narrative approaches, which are all really interesting. I think... They're sort of forms of storytelling. But I, th I, th I suppose I think about my work as narrative in a sort of broader sense of how one articulates story, how one, how one tells another of how they see the world, how, how they view things, how they understand the world, how, what are the possibilities, what are the fictioning possibilities of, of, of the world? How can you change the world? How can you input and communicate and, and, and have a backwards and forwards with yourself and like an external reality or other people, you know? And so jewelry is really good for that, I think, because it's an act, isn't it? It's not, jewelry isn't an art form that you walk into a room and it's on a wall. It's a living with, it's a being with. It's like, it, it's a symbiotic relationship between human and non-human. You know, if you, if you wear a ring, like if it's a lead ring, the material has agency, you know, that, that ring kills you, you know, materials have agency and you live with them and you engage with them and, and they communicate backwards and forwards. I always thought jewellery was this incredibly powerful social tool because it, it is literally a, a, like a, another party present in a dialogue. So if you're talking to someone else and you're wearing a piece of jewellery, it's part of that. And because of that, it's hard for it, I think, in many ways, not to be sociopolitical. You know, you, you wear things because they express your thought or you're attracted to things or you find fascination in things because they they express parts of your thinking or thoughts or even things that you can articulate. You know, that's why you're that's a whole that's one of the things about materials is that, you, you know, or artworks is you're, you're communicating through nonverbal ways. You know, that I'm living with this thing because this is me. This is somehow uh, there's a connection, an attachment between me and this thing but it also says this thing that I want it to say. And so I've sort of used my work to be quite explicit in that, that, you know, these narratives are narratives of pulling apart or deconstructing my ideas and understanding of, of, of the world, but also how I see myself in the world, what are the problems that we want to communicate and discuss. 
you know, I, I had a show at Gallery SO a couple of years ago. It had a rather cracking title, as I have with it, it's called Thoughts Between the Land and Sea, Raising the Dogger Land. And it was, it all had, it all came from this theoretical vantage point. The Dogger Land was a space between the UK and France and Belgium, and it, it sunk under the North Sea. And I was thinking, what in a time of Brexit and quite an isolated internal thinking about what Britishness is, which I don't agree with, what, what does that mean? And so all these pieces of, of, of narrative, and there were about 18 pieces of, of jewellery and artworks, but they, they created this multi-layered thing of, of looking at, I suppose, identity. It was identity. What is identity in a time of change and shift, and uh, especially shifts that you don't agree with? And to wear one of those things, is, is I always say it's such the, the exciting possibility of, of jewelry as well. You make something with intention, right? And then it has this, like, I don't know what, a hermeneutic interpretation from someone else. And through their wearing, it becomes something else. And it becomes different, you know, a different political or socio political conversation. It's like, it's one of, the, I think I frustrate some of my, my friends and colleagues because when they say, you know, you don't design for the body and I sort of don't I design knowing it's going on a body no and the reason is because I don't see jewelry as a body art form it's a person art form it's, it's not body centric it's person centric whenever I think about the body you make really sort of reductive ideals of, of who that body might be and actually when that when someone puts on your jewelry and they change and it changes and their, their, their character and their personality and the way they carry themselves changes that artwork and that artwork changes them. It's a really powerful, beautiful thing. So it's, it's never a static statement. It's, it's a constantly shifting socio-political statement. It doesn't just, it's not just made and left to be viewed. It's, it's engaged with and lived with, and it's, it's a sort of being with a thing, you know, and, and how those, conversations develop beyond the exhibition in onto the wearer and, and into a social context uh, that's the sort of stuff I find really fascinating you know is it fair to say Jonathan in a way that your work by wanting to adorn an identity mm. rather than a body gaze is important as much as writing requires someone to read the text your jewelry is maybe designed in such a way that it does require the gaze to be present and that maybe there is something there in terms of scale and not wanting to be too limited by that body too. Yeah, I think there is. And that's that's become more prominent as my work has developed. I mean, there used to be pieces I made that were quite shy. You know, things were hidden. Texts would be hidden within works and they would open up. And so they were quite secretive. They were secret relationships between the wearer and the, and the, and the object. Interesting, yeah. And I, I think it's, it's developed away from that towards these more explicit things that, that involve the gaze and interpretation and analysis, hermeneutics, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and ha yeah you're right. I hadn't really thought about that, but it has developed that way, yeah. Unlike a significant amount of, of these interactions we have with text, it's mostly a sort of in a 2D manner. Your pieces are, of course, a 3D. Often the visual language of your work also reminds me of sort of cast-led typeface. Is this all deliberate? And if so, why is that important to you? It, it's really important because I think the majority of my practice you could view as a jewellery practice, but you could also view as a writing practice, which is why I say I'm sort of a writer and sort of a jeweller, because it's, it's somewhere in between. And so most of the works are made of words. Um, and jewellery and, and text have this really historic relationship. But I suppose in, in my work, it's really explicit. Um, it stems from being really engaged or interested in text generally. I mean, I love the case room not for the purpose of making print, you know. I think I was interested in the lead type, and you know? I was interested in, in the forms and the smells and the, and, and, and the environment of the case room. I, I just think they're incredible. I remember the exact point. I was studying at the RCA, and I'd always used text in my work, but it's always been a way of highlighting a narrative or, or you know, subtly adding something, you know, because words add things in different ways depending on, on their visuality and their, how you might interpret them in their context, obviously. 
And I, I was reading a book, it was Jean-Paul Sartre's words, which I've never actually finished reading. I'm, actually, I, I'm the world's best reader of first chapters, actually. <laughs> and because of dyslexia, whatever it was, the words started bouncing around the page. They literally just lifted off and they started moving around. And I thought, oh, that's it. And so I made a piece where I literally had the words coming off and there were three brooches of little piles of words. And it was quite a simple thing, really, but it, it had a real, it really sort of set my thinking for, the, for a long time afterwards that, okay, there's a thing here about form and meaning and meaning and form and how meaning informs form and how form informs meaning. That sounds really pretentious, but it's true. So, so in my writing practice, and I do write, two-dimensionally in in my writing practice i also write three-dimensionally so there's a piece i made which i think is a good example it's called a, an extended rant on craft and i'd written this lecture on craft and where it sits within art and design you know, so boring and uh, you know everyone we can't still be having these conversations you know i was saying it to speaking to my friends about it in the pub later and they're like, oh, you're still going on about that who cares you know so I, I turned that, that conversation, I sort of recorded the conversation I had with my friends. It was part formal lecture, part them taking the piss out of me. And I turned it into a, an endlessly repeating spiral. And so it became a bangle because that's, that's, that's the, the form it took. And so the form, it was called a never-ending rant on craft because these arguments are never-ending. But the form directly informed the meaning it was the meaning the form is the meaning and the meaning is the form and, and they're not separable you can you can't read it on a flat sheet of paper and have the same understanding of that text you have to read it in in that three-dimensional form i sometimes rather naturally think of some of the works as like a form of concrete concrete poets poetry you know so all the all the stuff the italian marinetti instructors were, were doing you know that where they would use the typography room to to lead how you read something so that words would get bigger or words would get smaller so you would read it differently it would become hushed or louder or sharper or quieter i try and think about how how that might become for how that might we might engage with words in a physical way i mean i like so i like working in so I don't, I don't i don't know why i just keep returning to it and it lends itself through oxidization to these sorts of forms of inky leady lead typeface forms and that, that association with type and text is, is really helpful because it helps ground the, the pieces in literature, you know? And, and they, they, I, I've been quite interested in, in people who write about language. So Roland Barr, Gilles Deleuze, particularly Jack Derrida, you know, talking about deconstruction, how we pull apart texts and how we might, we might reconstruct them in new forms of meaning. So to have it have work that's very clearly placed in a in a lineage of both jewelry and of literature or of writing, I sort of it's what it's what I've always wanted, if that makes sense. The portability and the sort of changing context of jewelry, there's something of that mobility that's quite interesting to add to text. Is that a deliberate as well? Or yeah, it's it's a really it's a really important point, actually, and something I consider quite a lot because people have always asked if, if I reproduce the texts I make in, in three dimensions, and I never do. They're, they are meant to be read in that form, and I, I'll never reproduce the text because it would be untrue. It would be a lie. It would be a copy and a, a poor one. And so if you wore a thing, each time you wore it, you're likely to see a new textual narrative emerge. And so each word takes on a new context a new meaning and you it, they become shape-shifting you know in in sort of interesting interesting ways you know i've, I've made pieces where they're linked together tra linked narratives and so if what you wear it and then 10 seconds later a link has moved and so the relationship of the language is completely changed you know and those sorts of interactions between texts and the sort of for me it also does strange things it makes you think about the arbitrariness of, of language our engagement particularly through social media, thinking of Twitter and so words are so fleeting or can be very fleeting. By making a solid shape of them, you also take text in a very different direction than, than that very, very quick contact we are very used to now. Has that changed any of your practice? It has done a little bit, actually. I mean, I, I've been working a lot recently in, in virtual reality, uh, engaging in sort of 
handwriting and, and the sort of temporality of, of engaging in digital and virtual spaces, you know, and how long lasting those, those words and meanings and shapes are. But there's, there's a sort of thing, I think, between practice and theory, between the solidity of making a word solid, but also the sort of liquidity of its meaning and the shape shifting of its meaning, you know, the, the possibilities it has, which are not solid. I don't know how it relates to social media, if I'm honest. I haven't really thought about it too much. Maybe I should. It's interesting because uh, in research I took a few years ago, not in terms of online engagement. I don't use Twitter. I'm not very good at it. I was, I really fret quite terribly about my writing. So the idea of posting something very short online puts fear of God into me. But I did a sort of research project engaging with a city and how we engage with language. And I think I walked 10 minute walking to work and counted over 40 five thousand words on the way and so the, you know, the fleeting aspect of how we engage with language in a, a constant barrage of, of information just hitting us you know so you currently have a solo show on at gallery marse in the netherlands titled emergent dialogues of the topo philic line could you share a little bit more about the ideas behind the show and the pieces that can be seen there for those who have not got the luxury to travel to the netherlands perhaps of course. So, yes, you're right. It's called Emergent Dialogues of the Topophilic Line, <laughs> which is, which is, I was very proud of that title. I, a lot of my works have titles which are quite involved, quite poetic, quite large, quite long, a little bit pretentious. But I, I think what they do, or what they do to me, is they sort of puncture stuff a little bit. And I think one of the great things about jewelry, no matter how serious you're being, it really talks about human nature and the human condition and so it has to have com it has to have humor in there some way because people have humor you know comedy and tragedy they come in equal measures you know i mean that's life and so all, all the things i title my work with the intentions of, of the titles are really genuine really pure and honest you know i really want to talk about emergent dialogues at the top of the line but i also know by saying that that i sound incredibly pretentious but when you read it, it just makes people smile or they look at you a little bit like, you've been serious. And that to me is like the first engagement with the work, you know, that uh, uh, these words can make you already sort of self-doubt or question, am I meant to know what that means? Is he, does he know what that means? Am I meant to know that he knows what that means? You know, am I, am I, am I, how am I meant to engage with this? And so there's a sort of a, a fun interplay with, with, with words that it's called that because um, I, I go away and I move away from language and from forms of writing. And then I always find myself coming back to it, which isn't the intention, but I just do. And so the project was really an experiment to see, I've done some works really focusing on drawing and I've done a lot of works obviously fighting on text and writing. And so I want to see if I could do something down the middle. You know, there's all this really interesting stuff around, I've been really reading a lot of a, a, a guy called Tim Ingold, who's an anthropologist, who's a professor up in Aberdeen. And he, he, he's written some incredible books about lines and the anthropology of a line, how we follow lines and what lines mean and what lines lead to. And of course, lines lead to words and words lead to meaning. And so what happens if you follow a line? What is the emergent dialogue? What is the thing that comes from a line? And so I was writing with a virtual reality headset on writing in three dimensions and writing like a performance so I was drawing something that related to to the hand or something and I was it was a bit quite self-referential to the hand but I was drawing it in a way that was completely embodied and it was entirely surrounding me and what's nice is when you don't write with a ground so when you don't have a canvas or you don't have paper words become three-dimensional they start to fold on themselves because you've got nothing to press against so Whereas form informed meaning in the past, the meaning literally or the, or the intention of the word literally became the form because the words would start to, to move. And as I was moving around the space, the words would fold and shift and change. And so <clears throat> that's what they were. They were virtual performances of writing. And I was listening to music and I was listening to audio books of some people I'm really interested in, Tim Ingold being one, and using myself as like a siphon for stuff so listening and engaging in this completely bright pink or bright blue space with nothing else in it nothing you can see and you have this really weird thing in virtuality where it's an entirely embodied disembodied experience you can't see your body you can't 
see it, you don't know it's there, but you are completely embodied and every movement you make has the possibility to be created. And so I was performing and acting as a siphon to write these forms. And, and you can't read them in a linear way because they're of the way they fold in on themselves. So there's something quite nice that I'll never know the linear meaning of them. And my interpretation of them will always be, you know, based around how the language and form sort of and meet each other. The writing was sort the writing and the performance of the writing was sort of the artwork. But you know, I'm, I'm I am a jeweler and I I, I want to see things in object form to understand how we engage with them and how we read them and how we interpret them, all that sort of stuff. And so I had them we had them 3D printed and then I they were electroformed as well so that they could be quite large and they could be quite light. Michael Rowe and I were talking about what they become and we sort of saw them as like fossilizations of something. It's nice because they were built via SLS printing. So they were built in a sedimentary way and then electroforming is sedimentary and they were sort of fossilizations of a process. So they, they sort of became these textual fossilizations, which I know sounds pretentious as well, but in, in that way, it's, they, they were quite interesting objects. They were, and because obviously fossilizations and jewelry, you know, or, or sedimentation and, and jewelry, you know, stones and, and rocks and all that stuff go hand in hand. So they were in some way another form of, of sedimentary jewelry, you know. And so they were they were sort of keys into understanding their own creation. So you would look at them and 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 have to try and understand how they were made, which was through this really sort of performative writing drawing three-dimensional doodling it becomes a, it's a stream of consciousness thing you have self-published a jewelry manifest yeah jewelry objects language and other thoughts and within this publication you use images essays montages to deconstruct in a sense your own work the past 10 years of your practice as well as the even the format of a paperback could you tell us a little bit more about how your work has evolved over these years, perhaps, and, and in relation to then that sort of the main influences and how reflecting on it through these different media, how that is important to you? That's a really interesting question. I mean, I wrote that book, and I self-published that book when I started working at the RCA. Prior to that, I'd always worked in a school of design, and now I work in a school of arts. So I work with fine artists on a sort of daily basis. I think in a school of design, I was sort of on the outskirts as someone who was really interested in, in, in theory and how theory integrates into material practice. And now in a school of fine art, or school of arts, I'm on, I'm on the outskirts as someone who's interested in theory but really wants to develop a material practice. But I do feel more comfortable in a school of, of arts. I feel, I feel really comfortable in, in my feeling that jewellery is, is, is a form of of artwork which requires real thought and consideration of, of like what it is not that it has to be pretentious and overthought and overwrought but that in in that book I actually think about a little bit about comedy and and look at scholars writing about comedy and how comedy is always undermined compared to tragedy you know tragedy is the important part no one ever wins a, a, an Oscar for a comedy ever but I think there's, it's really fascinating that because these parts of, of, of human nature that, 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 that deal with humour or fascination, you know, are sort of overlooked. And jewellery deals with, with fascination, you know, the small, the, 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 the micro, the thing that is, is, is metaphorically, you know, it's really small but metaphorically massive. You know, we look into a diamond and see the universe. You know, that's amazing. And so... I wanted to write something, you know, okay, what, what does it mean to understand your jewellery practice as a form of writing, you know? And so I think what it uncovered was how one progresses through ideas, you know? I sort of wrote it, and you never know who you're writing these things for. I wrote it for myself, obviously, but I also thought, well, it might be good, you know, it might be interesting for someone who's in their final year of a BA or first year of a, a master's degree I wanted it to be about that, that sort of point of, of understanding how an art practice is contextualised in a wider space. It was written in quite conversational, broad tone, which is how I talk to myself. You know, it's, 
the writing was very performative and so I, there's lots of textual tropes and pages move around and the book i've made is is a deconstruction of a paperback because when i read i do deconstruct reading you know not intentionally but i it's just how it, it works you know how ideas develop okay well you know you're interested in 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 oh i was interested in, in text but how did how did that develop through those years and where's that leading to so actually it it goes from you're all like all interests they go from quite surface engagements or an interest a fascination to layers of depth and how you think or choose between the distractions or how you choose to embrace the distractions of an artistic practice or where you follow and so I suppose, it, yeah, it, it was written trying to understand a, a working methodology. You know, this is how I work, how I make decisions about where the work is going, how I find influences from a broad range of popular culture and theory and philosophy and in art and design. I wrote it at the same time I had that exhibition at Gallery SO. That exhibition doesn't feature. I was, you know, sometimes you're at a point where you just want to, I was looking back and looking forward. And so I would see them as the same thing. So the publication was like, okay, I've got this exhibition coming up and I, it's really important to me, but I want to know how I got there and I want to understand and contextualize how I got to this point. That publication does that. It sort of contextualizes a whole 10 years worth of, of, of a journey of, of thought through a practice, trying to get to, to grips with, with in my own head, all the boring arguments as, as well around art and design, where craft fits in with that, and you know, saying no, this is this is where I see jewelry. You know, it's a language. I see jewelry as a language, and I'm going to describe it as best I can as a language. I mean, it's interesting that you then chose a medium that perhaps in the hierarchy of what is considered valid expressions of these, that it is a book or like a manifest in writing and not a piece of jewellery to do that. Do you think that that's because we're sort of part of a context that still expects that in a way? Yeah, no, I think I think part of it is, you know, we're in a context where books are still, you know, we're, we're both academics, so books are still seen as, as, as the thing. But, you know, books as objects, I just, I love them, you know. I mean, I love having books. I love having books more than I love reading. And so to, to make a book and to think about a book as a creative, as an artwork, you know, so there are, there are pages where I try and describe what I think jewelry is and, and the words literally fall off the page and they literally explode. They, you know, it's like when you, when you describe speculative processes, speculation ends up in unprovability. And so the words just fall apart and they fall off the page. And so if you're gonna, if you're gonna play with the, the, the parameters of a book and experiment with a book, I mean, actually, the entire book is printed on top of a photocopy of another book. So I think it's it's a George Orwell book. I photocopied the entire book and then just overlay my book on top because it was a book that I had and I loved and it had, it had a penguin cover. So it has that materiality, that, you know, that thing that's so visceral. And I'm not, I'm not sure that entirely answers the question, but... I don't know that there has to be an answer. It's... it's um... It was just an observation. Um, oh. You are known to integrate digital tools into the production of your work, which you have stated reflects hypermodern times. Could you share a little bit more about these techniques and how you incorporate them? Like I said, a lot of it stems from having that skill base that I got from my education. You know, I, I know I can make a metal box. I know I can work with a fair amount of refinement. You know, I'm not the world's greatest silver myth or metal work or whatever. But, you know, I, I do have that skill set and I get very bored doing the same thing over and over again. It's just not who I am. I, I can't sit at the bench and make the same thing again and again. My ideas don't facilitate it. I don't think I've ever made a piece, and this sounds really self grandizing but it's true. I don't think I've ever really made many pieces unless they're part of an iteration of pieces where I know how to make them. So whenever I think of something, I usually don't know how to make it. Through that not knowing, I've had to find ways of, of making it. So, you know, that started off with things like CAD, you know, this is a sort of formal learning of CAD that you do and, you know, using former 
in industry packages like Rhino, which are really orthographic packages. They're made for drawing buildings and ships and phones and stuff. And so you, you're placed within a set of limitations. And so you quickly grow out of those limitations. And so I think all, all of it's to do with like a, a rigorous seeing and a rigorous doing. You know, it's like if you want things to, to be text, then you have to find ways of, 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 of making them so that they are text. And of course, text is, is, a, is an industrial process. Making lead type is an industrial process. So you have to sort of use some industrial processes. In those cases, there were a lot of 3D printing. And I used, I used to make really complex sprueing systems. I was quite interested in how casting works. I'm fascinated by how casting works because there's that thing about solidity again and how we assume that metal is solid and actually it isn't solid. It's just some metals are solid at room temperature. Uh, and that's a completely sort of humanistic way of thinking about it, you know, because in other climates and other areas, you know, they're, they're not, you know, gallium melts, mercury's liquid, you know, it, it, within our conditions of us being habitable, metals are solid, but actually the, the fluidity and liquidity of metal I find fascinating. Casting is all part of that. But, uh, you know, um, how you record the world and how you record the world as, as parts of research process, technology is just... I mean, I, I do use Instagram. I'm not very good at using it because I don't, for me, that's publishing, that's publishing, actually. It is publishing. And often at points of research and at rigorous looking, that's for me, I'm still trying to think about why I looked at that stone. And so I take thousands of photographs, you know, usually of like the corner of a shoe or something. Just there's something that, that's like, oh, that, I've never seen that before. Like the way a, a, like a weed dies or you know, there's a different colour of gravel in amongst it, or there's like an enormous amount of fag butts in a patch of, you know, weird things that you see. And so I, so I, so I photographed those. And I got bored with that and I started using photogrammetry, which is where you take 30 photographs and you, you make a digital mesh. And then I found I could make jewellery completely away from the bench. So I could, I could make little assemblages out and about using detritus and street junk and stuff. And then I could photogrammetry them and then have them printed and they would be this weird relationship to this space. You know, I think there's a, always a relationship between jewelry and place. So what does that then become this? And also there's this thing about miniaturization in jewelry as well. So what happens when you miniaturize these, these things, they again take on that, you know, people sort of push miniaturizations or miniature things, so they also see that as not important. And I see them as really important. I'm fascinated by small stuff and how we make things small or, have, or, or portable or whatever. So the technology is always because I'm trying to find ways of keeping up with the ideas that are coming. So, you know, I wanted to make, I, I did, this must be about eight years ago now, a show. And I, I, try, I was thinking about production jewelry, but I was also, we'd gone to the V&A and we'd seen these on trombo pieces of jewelry, you know, the jewelry that flutters with your heartbeat. I thought it was so beautiful how you could make something that has life or that, that speaks about life. And, you know, I can't, I didn't make something in spring. I ended up making a set of production pieces, but they were an animation. So I made 70 brooches that, that documented the life cycle of a weed and each brooch was a moment in time. But then you need for that, for you to think about how you show that, you, know, you need to engage with technology because I, I need to, to animate and then I need to make objects from the animations. And so, I, yeah, I, I, technology is, is just, it's just a tool. It's just, it's just a tool. Oh, they're all just tools, and they're all as creative as you're willing to be with them. I, I, and so, all technology can be hacked as well, and it can be collaborated with. You know, if this last stuff in the VR, it would start glitching, and oh, that was really nice because it, I was I was pushing it to its limits. And those glitches reveal something else. So the collaboration with the machine, you know, it reveals something else. It gives you something else. Actually, I'm, I'm sort of sitting on the way to take part in a research lab discussing um, AI and how AI narratives can be developed. And there's something nice about that collaboration, or how, how you think more collaboratively with machine rather than it being like an enforced, I'm going to do this through that. You go into it thinking, well, how does it work? How do I engage with it? And what does it feed back into the practice? Technology is something I use for everything and and... I'm keen to try and keep understanding what, where new, so like, you know, things like 
3D GAN where you work with AI machines to create objects. I'm really fascinated by that. I'm not sure my work will develop into it, but I'm try, I do try and keep on top of these things because they're creative tools. And when you learn creative tools or when you learn physical creative tools, you know, I was saying, I'm always trying to keep up with what I'm thinking. They make you think different things. So the more you progress with a tool, the more it the more you think, well, I could do that somehow in the future. But of course you can't do that because that doesn't do that, but it lets you get to a point where you can start thinking beyond what it can do. And then you've got to find another way of making it. So I think as a jeweler, I've probably spent about 30% of my time at the bench and the rest of it inhabiting virtual worlds of some form or, or you know, industry, working with industry manufacturers. So, and I, I like that because there's, there's a, a slight sort of manageable chaos to it as well, where you're working between different forms of reality or in understandings of reality in places and spaces, whether that's craft or virtual or industry or production, you know, you, I quite like flitting between all those things. That thing about hyper-modern modernity, though, is there's that thing about us living in the simulation and how we engage with the simulation and, and the layering of, of, of symbols and meanings and how we engage those layers of symbols and meanings. And I think a lot of that feeds into my, to my work. So it's certainly you know, when we talk about the socio-political stuff, how we engage with signs and symbols and, and the layered simulation of, of like daily reality or actually working, I suppose, in a simulated environment, you know? So that, those sort of hyper-modern things, I, I think, I play on my mind quite a lot. You previously were a lecturer at the Glasgow School of Art, and you're now the head of applied arts at the prestigious Royal College of Art in London. How do you combine a career in education research with practice? And what is perhaps your vision for education in jewellery and particularly the departments at the RCA? It is it's difficult, you know, to, to balance a practice and, and, and working full time. But, but at, the, at the same time, as I said before, I think, you know, I, I sort of have to do creative stuff. Like I can't not do it. So it, it, it just happens. One of the great things, I mean, the great thing about the RCA is that it's almost entirely, it is entirely postgraduate. So everyone wants to be here in ways that maybe sometimes undergraduate students don't. Postgraduate, so people are like, no, I want to learn that. I want to learn exactly that. And so you've got quite a lot of very serious, when I say serious, they're serious about their education and they're serious about their, their practice. They're not necessarily grumpy, serious people, but they're very serious about wanting to be artists and designers and learn. I think every artist is a little bit competitive, aren't they? I mean, that, that might not be true. You look at these incredible people coming in and doing their work, you think, oh yeah, I better go home and think about my stuff. You know, I, I, need, I need to, yeah, I'm, I'm not getting left behind. I'm, that's a joke, but you know, I mean, you work with someone like Michael Rowe or, or David Ruffier, you know, and, and you're sort of, blown away and, and by the students you're blown away by their creativity and that is for me equal parts inspiring and challenging you know it's like oh, i'm completely inspired by them right i need to get back and i need to get back and make stuff i need to go and do stuff and also you know i'm I, i'm a practice-led researcher so my, my research is, is developed through making and, of course, through writing, but, you know, often writing is a creative practice as well. So, you know, I, I think those boundaries between all, all the types of knowledges that can be, that can emerge from research and what we gain from an understanding of the arts is so vital and so important to the world. You know, it's not just, the arts aren't just a, a communication about what's happening they are the communication this is this is how we see and understand the world not just from an artist perspective but everyone you know this is the, the arts are, are the expression of of, of 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 reality of understanding of meaning you know and so we sort of live in sort of i think we sort of live in quite neoconservative times where people don't appreciate that in ways that they should it's just so important to me you know I can't imagine a life without the Beatles, you know? I mean, because it, it's not just a pop song. It, it was for so long, so much of my life, a validation that someone else understood the world the way I did. You know, that's what the arts are. When you read a, a book, oh, you go, oh, someone else 
gets that. I didn't realize someone else saw that. And so the arts are, are the expression of, of, of everything. They're not, they're not a commentary. They are a commentary, but you know, they, they are it, you know? And as a, a practitioner, I engage with practice, I research. So I'm, in, I'm engaging with practice as part of my job. You know, how can the arts uncover new knowledge? And that's often poetic knowledge or it could be technical knowledge. And I think my research is actually weirdly balanced between the two for those reasons I, I just said, but they're also weirdly connected and also weirdly disconnected. So there's this sort of, these sorts of forms of poetic and narrative knowledge that come through my creative thinking but they're absolutely dependent on technical processes which have to be developed in order to fuel them. And of course, the developments offer new possibilities. So being, being a researcher really allows me to, to, to progress my practice. And that, it also allows me to progress the types of practice that I have, which, you know, you hope are in some way innovative or you hope are, you, I mean, I'm just always interested in stuff I haven't seen before, which is what the arts do, you know? And so in terms of my, my, my vision, I mean, I think it's broadly in line with, with, with my own philosophy of the importance of the arts and the importance of making. You know, it's interesting. I, I have a bit of a debate. Officially, my, my, my job title is the head of applied arts. And I would like to remove the S because applied arts is about disciplines. Applied art is about the applications. So I'm really interested in about how we engage with the multiplicity of, of possibilities that materials offer. You know, so when you work with a, a, a clay artist, yes, they're interested in form and there's a tradition of, of formalism and uh, within ceramics practice, but actually how do we engage with the ground? How do we engage with, with muds? You know, uh, what does this stuff mean? Because actually through working with it, we can find new ethical, sustainable approaches to, to working in a world where actually we, we need to have creative thought processes because we're, we're sort of at a junction where that creativity is essential, you know? If, so I suppose, I suppose in that way, there's a, uh, there is a, a, a research importance to the types of practices which are happening. You know, how, how do we research through materials and how do they impact, how, how do they impact the world? How can we make change? And I do think the applied arts, and in fact, if you want to use that term, I mean, it's not, I have to say, it's not my favourite term, but, you know, stuff which we make, they do have impacts. They do have real we, we We are making the world around us and we're making how we're seen and engaged with in the world around us. So, you know, really enforcing and pushing that, that, important narrative is is i mean i don't know if that counts as a vision but that emphasis that oh, oh, maybe even contextualizing it as, as research is is also part of it saying well, this is this is important if that's the language that helps you understand the importance of this then that's fine I mean, we have a student an amazing student one of my personal tutees called ku xin liu and she's been working with her microbiome She's been going to Cambridge University and she's been taking samples of her microbiome or the thousands of bacteria that make up our bodies. And from that, she's making music objects and, and artifacts. It is the most translatable, understandable way of explaining that we are collaborative beings that I have ever seen. And it, it contains poetic knowledge, it contains scientific knowledge, and it contains interpretation, which artists and designers do in the most incredible ways, you know? So I don't know if that, that's probably not a vision. I think it's still developing. I think I'm still developing how the two programs work together as well. There's a really interesting, the differences between clay artists and, and glass artists or clay artists and jewelers is, is really quite radical. You know, clay artists really work through embodied processes in ways that I've never seen, you know, it's, it's I am the material, the material is me. And jewelers are far more theoretical, far often quite introverted. You know, that they're, they're, they're dealing with scales and, and what's on the inside, and they're arguing often with the material. You know, you don't, I, I don't have a conversation with metal. I argue with metal and it pushes back. And so there are these really interesting differences in, in approach and how they start to influence each other. I'm really interested in how, how jewelry can offer conceptual lenses to, to making practices in, 
embodied materials and how that real materiality embodied approach can inform thinking in, in, in jewellery, because of course the body is quite, quite important. You know, I've, I've written lots of fairly pretentious stuff about trying to view the programs from a sort of flatter ontological plane. So not completely flat because you can't get rid of the human in, in jewellery because the jewel person to these, but you know, try and view things in a sort of more post-human way, you know, how, how, what are the agencies of materials and what are the agencies of persons and what the, what's the, what's the materiality of the internet? What is the you know, so trying to view things from a, 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 a sort of flatter collaborative perspective. What is something we can look forward to for you doing in the near future? Is there anything you're working on that you would like to share with us? <laughs> I only just had that show at Marse a month less than a month ago, so I, I'm I'm in, I'm in the post-show recovery period. Unfortunately, nothing I should probably talk about, but hopefully, hopefully, my work will be taken part in in, in a, a museum show in Germany, which is really exciting. And I'm also working with with a patron um, towards a piece for a major museum in, in the UK as well, which is quite an exciting commission. So, working particularly for the, the narratives of, of, a, of a certain museum. So that's very exciting. But I, I am going through a, a period of, of, of slight, I'm happy that's now over and I can, I can go on to the next thing. Writing, I, I'm trying to enter an, another period of, 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 of writing and, and reflecting on what has been quite a dense few years of, of quite intense practice and engagement with the world. You know, being on Zoom and, and how that's changed in my thinking and how it changes everything, I suppose. Um, and then lots of very exciting things with, with my work at the RCA as well. I mean, we're moving to a one year model next year for the first time ever, which is a massive change. But I, I think it's going to make it more open for people applying. You know, living in London has become really dis difficult. And, how people are learning has changed. You know, I think how people engage with, I mean, I've been doing quite a lot of, of, of visual lectures, you know, performative visual lectures, video montage, all that sort of stuff. I'm trying to think about creative ways of, of, of delivering. I don't think we've ever watched so many non-fiction things. You know, our appetite for information is enormous, but how we take that in, has, I think has changed quite drastically. So. A lot of experimentation there in quite creative ways, but which are about learning, I think. Wearing and making jewellery is the participation in crafting and sharing stories. As makers, we produce pieces that can be considered vessels for communication, and in some cases be statements in a socio and political sense. Beyond making and exhibiting well considered pieces, Jonathan researches, reflects, and educates the next generation in the many roles jewellery can play in our society. For sharing your insights into your practice and work, I would like to thank you a lot, Jonathan. We're incredibly grateful for your time and very much look forward to seeing what you do next. Thanks so much. Thanks very much for having me. Next month, I'll be joined by another guest, so watch this space to find out who it is. But for now, this was Sophie Boons for the BAJ podcast episode titled The Language of Jewelry with Jonathan Boyd. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful day.